opening statement set to begin this morning in former President Donald Trump's criminal hush money trial. After jury selection wrapped up on Friday, the 12 person jury is made up of seven men and five women, along with six alternates. Later this morning, both the prosecution and the defense are expected to lay out their cases during opening statements. According to the New York Times, the prosecution plans to frame Trump's actions of payments to keep adult film actress Stormy Daniels quiet about an alleged affair as election interference. The defense, meanwhile, will seize on three apparent weak points, witness credibility, the president's culpability, and the case's legal complexity complexity. One of the potential first witnesses expected to testify is David Pecker, the former CEO of America Media Incorporated, who bought and buried damaging stories about Trump. It's called catch and kill. His, he is alleged to have worked with Trump and his former attorney, Michael Cohen, to bury the Stormy Daniels story. Other witnesses expected to testify include Michael Cohen, Stormy Daniels, former Trump aide Hope Hicks, and former Playboy model Karen McDougal, who also alleged a sexual relationship with Trump. And as former President Trump left court on Friday, he continued to insist that he plans to testify in his own defense. Oh, joining us now, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and also MSNBC legal analyst Danny Savalo. Sorry about that. We thought uh, we were going to hear Trump, but obviously we've heard what we had to say a thousand times. Um, so, Lisa, what do we expect today? Uh, we know that one of the first witnesses is David Pecker, but do you expect that opening statements get finished today? Or just technically, what are we looking for in terms of getting accomplished today in court? Mika, a lot of the judicial housekeeping that you would expect to be taken care of before the trial really starts has all been brushed off Judge Mershon's plate. He's decided all of the pretrial motions. We have a jury, as you noted, that's been sat. So I expect that very soon after 930 this morning, we will get to opening statements. And while neither of the parties has outlined exactly how long they will take, as Danny knows better than anyone, an opening statement is your opportunity to preview your case for the jury. And while you want to do that in a way that gives them an overview, you also don't want to exhaust them. I expect that neither side will take more than roughly 60 to 70 minutes. And that means that we will have time to get to the first witness who, as you noted, is expected to be former chairman of American Media and the National Enquirer, David Pecker. Lisa, where are we on jurors these days? Because two had to leave and there were only six spares to begin with. So does that mean we're down to four potential spares or no, there's still how many do we have left and are they sequestered? Can you just talk a little bit about how they are being managed, so to speak, during this process as all this intense scrutiny and there's so much press surrounding it? Right. So the two jurors that we lost were replaced that same day, leading to a total of 12 jurors who have been seated. In addition to that, we do have six alternates. The jurors, however, are not sequestered, Elise. Mm -hmm. There have been accommodations made to ensure their anonymity. However, we don't know, for example, what provisions are being taken to get them to the courthouse for their departure from the courthouse, what the lunch provisions are. In federal court, in the E. Jean Carroll trials, both of those juries were not only anonymous, but steps were taken to ensure that, for example, they didn't come directly from their home to the courthouse. They met the U.S. Marshals at an off-site location and then were brought to the courthouse underground so that nobody would see their comings and goings. I'm hopeful that Judge Mershon is able to make some similar provisions for the jurors in this case so that they can remain protected throughout the, the duration of the trial. So here's the thing. I think juror attrition could be a real problem in this case. I mean, just do the math. Last week, we lost two jurors jurors before the trial even began. When you think about it, you do lose jurors during a trial. I've lost them. They fell asleep. They don't follow the judge's orders. But you don't normally lose a juror after the moment they're selected and between that and the time that the trial actually begins because ordinarily nothing happens during that time. But in this case, you have an example where a juror goes home, they start really thinking about their duty and what this is going to entail, and they come back and say, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. 
By the way, that's also something that happens from time to time. I've had it in organized crime cases. You have jurors who come up to the judge and say, I'll do anything, please. I do not want to be on this jury. I'm afraid. That's not obviously the same situation here, but you do have jurors who are going to have second thoughts. And the question becomes, will six alternates be enough to cover this trial? I hope so. But if what we've seen so far, if that's the rate of loss of jurors, two or before we even start the trial, that could be a real problem. And that could lead to a mistrial, which in I think the defense's view is a win, even though it doesn't mean you start the trial again in a year or something like that. Mistrials, normally uh, the court schedules the retrial as soon as they possibly can. But uh, yeah, juror attrition is going to be a real issue in this case. And again, I couldn't agree more with Lisa. Opening statements are not going to be all day. Look for an hour from the prosecution and probably less from the defense, because all they're doing today is offering a preview. They're, you're going to hear this probably many times. The evidence will show that dot, dot, dot. The evidence will show that dot, dot, dot. It's really just a promise to the jurors of what the facts will show. And if you're the defense, you do not want to be making a lot of promises. For example, you will not hear the words, <laughs> you're going to hear from the defendant himself, because if you make that promise, nobody's going to forget it. So they will say, my, I expect the prosecution will try to focus on something they've already seated the jury on, which is you're going to hear from some people who are not that credible, but they're not credible because they're Donald Trump's friends. On the defense side, you'll probably hear some version of try to keep an open mind. Uh, the evidence is not all in. We don't have the burden and just sort of the standard fare. But you're not going to see anything as flashy, anything as dramatic, as exciting as we're going to see during closing arguments. This is only going to be a preview and it will not take the entire day at all. <laughs> You know, um, as, as Danny said, in mob cases, there are jurors that will tell the judge that they're afraid for their safety and they, they want to get off. He said this isn't exactly like that, but really it, it, it is in many cases and that a lot of jurors are fearful mm -hmm. of, of, of repercussions if they're in uh, on a jury that's impaneled uh, that, that, that rules against uh, Donald Trump I mean, because they want their names out. The judge trying to keep the names from getting out there. But this is over time. This has proven to be very, well, very dangerous and tough. In this trial, everybody is under duress. Uh, you know, Donald Trump's past statements before the gag or even with the gag order about the judge, about yeah. the judge's daughter, about with the jury. Everybody is under a, a, a great deal of stress and yeah. concern about their safety. And I would add. Um, that it's Donald Trump, no matter which way this goes, that you got to keep your eye on because Donald Trump right now is enduring something that he's never had to endure in his entire life, where he has to be somewhere every day and do what he's told. When he's told to sit down by the judge, he has to sit down. That happened on Friday at least once. When he tries to get on his phone, he's told to get off of his phone. Um, he has to be there watching his former friends, David Pecker, Hope Hicks, and two alleged former lovers testifying for or against him. This is not what he's used to. Uh, this, is a, this is a guy, as we look at pictures of Donald Trump here, um, this is a guy, John Meacham, that has spent his entire life uh, creating this, this warped reality. Uh, that 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 goes wherever his mind wants it to go and keeping people around him that allows him to avoid reality, keeping people around him that does exactly what he wants to do. He was so proud of having a button on uh, on uh, his White House desk. He goes, I press this button and somebody brings in Diet Coke. He loved the complete control and and command and he has his entire life. And now he's sitting down six, seven, eight hours a day, and... Um, At 78 years old. 78 years old, judge telling him what to do, falling asleep, being mocked, uh, getting angry about that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, quite a situation territory. and new territory for Donald Trump. And arguably, no American in history has so warped everyone else's reality as well, right? I mean, it, it, it's not simply his imaginative universe. He's imposed 
his imaginative universe, his grievances, uh, his vision of uh, enemies versus himself on everyone. And we're living uh, in this, this warped reality. And so one thing about uh, the last couple of weeks and about these images that I think, maybe this isn't a particularly popular uh, thing to say, but this is actually a somewhat reassuring set of images because it suggests mm -hmm. that there is something more important than one single man and the will of one single man. And that is the rule of law. And he is submitting himself uh, to uh, the legal processes of the country. And it should remind people, uh, not of somehow or another his victimhood, but of that great Thomas Paine insight that we don't have a king. In America, the law is king. And what we're seeing in the New York courtroom, however, tawdry the uh, narrative around right. it is, the, the facts of the case, that doesn't matter. What matters is that the law itself is supreme. It's not yeah. just about the appetites and ambitions of one person. New NBC News polling finds Robert F. Kennedy Jr. taking more votes from Donald Trump than Joe Biden in this year's election. In a one-on-one -on -one matchup, the poll shows Trump ahead of Biden by two points, 46 to 44 percent among registered voters. That's within the poll's margin of error. But when the field expands to include third-party candidates, Biden takes the lead over Trump, 39 to 37 percent. That's because 15 percent of voters who previously said they would support Trump now say they would back RFK Jr. compared to just 7% of former Biden voters who say the same. Now, you, 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 never, you never know how this is going to break. In 1980, John Anderson... I kind of get the thinking. Yeah, John Anderson ran... Well, yeah, they're conspiracy theorists. Exactly. John, John Anderson ran as a Republican against Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And Jimmy Carter, he ended up taking votes away from Jimmy Carter right. when his intent was to take votes away from Ronald Reagan. And so, again, in this case, so interesting. we're seeing the same thing happen. President Joe Biden's odds of winning re-election are the highest they have been in at least three months. On the website Predict It, it now costs 54 cents to bet on a Biden victory and 45 cents to bet on a Trump victory. The more likely an outcome is, the more, li the more it costs to bet on. Biden's odds have been steadily increasing over the past month after Trump's odd reached a high of 48 cents in early March. We should note, though, that the site's tracker only goes as far back as late January. Let's bring in former Treasury official and, and morning uh, Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner. Steve, I saw this yesterday. And before we get into all your charts, I know you... You actually show uh, these uh, just where uh, the, the betting markets are, because sometimes they can be more accurate than even polls. Uh, but thought about you yesterday because uh, Joe Biden has uh, made move uh, quite a move over the last month or so. Yeah, I think there's no question by almost any measure that Joe Biden has had really a good month since the State of the Union. I think that has been mm -hmm. and may prove to be a turning point in the race, as you've shown your other polls. The, the betting markets, those of us who believe in markets, of course, believe that when you put real money down, even if it is a dollar, uh, you're putting some skin in the game. And they have historically been very accurate. They've had their misses. And more recently, for various reasons I won't bore you with, they have been a little bit less accurate than in the past. But nonetheless, this is a pretty significant move for the betting markets. They've been sitting there at roughly 50-50 for these two candidates for a long time. And so you are seeing some pretty positive green shoots, we can call them, I think, for President Biden and all of these numbers. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and we're going we're gonna to get, Steve, to your charts in one moment. I do want to go, though, uh, to John Meacham. John, you, you never, never know how things are going to break. I, I, I talked about John Anderson, 1980, a Republican, fellow Republican, who believed he was going to draw from Ronald Reagan. He ended up getting a lot of liberals and getting... A lot of college students voting for him. He got his 5%, but that, that came from Jimmy Carter, most of it. Um, and, of course, uh, speaking of RFK, we go back to 1968, something you and I have talked about a good bit. The Kennedy family still trying to figure out how after Bobby's tragic assassination, his votes, many of his votes, went to George Wallace. And it still can't sort it through. So you never know 
how this is going to break. But at least in this NBC News poll, it certainly looks like one anti-vaxxer uh, is going to be, you know, and a conspiracy theorist, I guess I should say, uh, is going to be taking votes from another conspiracy theorist. That's certainly where sort of common sense barstool analysis would lead you, right? I mean, if you are a... Uh, if you're thinking about voting for an anti-vax uh, person, I don't think your second choice is going to be uh, the Democratic incumbent uh, who believes in science uh, and is a uh, politician who's arguing for a consistency with a constitutional and rational order. That doesn't seem like exactly where you would go. Uh, historically, look, you're right, uh, Wallace in 68, uh, John Anderson uh, in 1980, of course, Ross Perot in 1992, who got 19 percent, uh, still a huge debate uh, within Bush world. Uh, both the senior President Bush uh, believed that Perot cost him the election. When you dive into the data, it's, it's, it gets tricky. But when you have uh, an alternative to the duopoly, uh, you end up in a uh, very uh, chancy place, particularly because, and this is why every single vote counts, particularly when you're talking about such de minimis margins uh, mm -hmm. across seven or eight swing states, you know, 500 votes here, 500 votes there. And, you know, to paraphrase Everett Dirksen, suddenly you're talking about, you know, that adds up to the presidency of the United States. And so I think uh, everybody has to have, if, if I may, a Mike Johnson moment, a Liz Cheney moment. They have to decide right. this year, where do you want history to judge you? How do you want history to judge you? And I think that this is that important, really do. South Dakota's Republican governor, Kristi Noem, says she'll stand by former President Trump, even if he gets convicted in his criminal hush money case. I'm hoping these jurors can come in and be unbiased and we'll, we'll let this case go forward in a swift manner that allows President Trump to get back on the campaign trail. Americans deserve to hear from their candidates and the Democrats and the activists are using this trial to derail him, to keep him in court instead of out talking to Americans about what their real concerns are. And their real concerns are their everyday lives. They need a leader in the White House who gets up every day and puts them first and doesn't raise their taxes, yeah. doesn't overregulate them, take away their freedoms and give all our money to other countries instead of making sure that we're taking care of America first and keeping us safe and secure. I, I just want to say for the record, there's absolutely no evidence that President Biden is involved in this. This is a case that, case that is being brought uh, in the state of New York by the Manhattan and that's, PA. And that's... That's what I think is remarkable, is that if you look at President Biden and what he's done and what his son has done and the fact that, that has uh, nothing, they are not being prosecuted that, for okay, some that of has, their crimes that, that has, they have that has nothing to do is really with this. kind of unprecedented. That has nothing to do not with, with this. Big picture, Governor, if Donald Trump is convicted in this trial, will you still support him in November? If my choice is between Joe Biden and, and Donald Trump every single day of the week, yes, I will support Donald Trump. I have from the very beginning. Uh, he has been someone that I have supported since 2016 because I recognized that he didn't think he was better than anybody else in this country. He wanted to go run for this office so he could serve the people here and fight for them every single day. Yeah, well, first of all, oh, boy. He, he inherited $400 million. She lied so he many flies around. times. I, it, it's, hard, it's hard to keep up with. It was hard to keep up, but I mean, Dana did a good job. But she, she will continue to support Donald Trump so despite the stench of corruption that's around him. You look at what a judge in, in, in New York uh, talking about how he's a rapist. She stands behind him. Uh, you, 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 uh, you look at the fact that he's found guilty of fraud. Uh, Republicans still stand behind him. You go on and on. And then the lies about Joe Biden and, the, you know, this Biden crime family thing. Oh, my You know, God. just stop. You're talking Obsession. to yourself. And, well, not only that, it's just they make fools of themselves time and time again. They've been lying about this for three years now. You know, Jenny Thomas lying about this when she wanted to overthrow American democracy. Jenny Thomas lying about this, talking about the, quote, Biden crime family and how they should be on a barge. Uh, and, and again, 
that committee that Arnold the Pig is the uh, Comer. legal counsel. Yeah, Comer, uh, Comer's committee. Um, they just they keep making fools of themselves. And Donnie, I've got to say, at some point, at some point, you know, the chickens come home to roost when you make when you make a fool of yourself time and time again, trying to go after Joe Biden. Uh, you, you don't know how to run the House of Representatives. You've got a candidate who a judge says is guilty of rape. Uh, you've got a candidate who uh, another judge says uh, is guilty of, you know, guilty of, of um, fraud. Takes um, credit for overturning Roe. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, and we can talk about Roe. But again, I'm talking about the stench of corruption. And, you, and then you have the documents case that even even pro-Trump attorneys say is a really strong case against Donald Trump. Uh, so, again, I know, I know people get what, triggered when they see stuff like that. I just think it catches up to them at the end. Yeah, I, I think the answer, Hunter Biden, is not a good rebuke against the president. No. As you said, he's got 91 yeah. counts against him and is sitting in a courtroom in New York City. I think it's 88, uh, 86 now. Yeah. Oh, it's only 86 or 88. Oh, now. Only okay. 86 88. or 88. That's right. They threw three there. But I don't think if that's all you got, and this is somebody who's potentially a vice presidential choice for Donald Trump, if that's your answer, you've got problems. And <clears throat> the Republicans have problems. And, you know, you, you that post headline that you guys showed earlier of Marjorie Taylor Greene, you know, yet that they're on the wrong side of just every issue. You mentioned abortion. They, you mentioned, they literally go on the wrong side of every issue. And at some point, voters vote. Yes, they vote for a candidate, but they vote on what's best for them and what's best for the country and what's best for their family. And the Republicans are on the wrong side of every single issue. And that's why it was so refreshing this weekend to see what Mike Johnson did. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, and Republicans have long done very well, you know, they talk about guns, gays, abortion, whatever, and Democrats were always painted as the radicals. It's amazing what the radicalism of Donald Trump and the radicalism of elements of the Republican Party, it's amazing the dynamics that they've now set up in elections where Democrats want to talk about abortion because the issue is a winner. They want to talk about gun safety. Because gun safety as an issue is a winner. Ninety percent of Americans want universal background checks. You have Republicans running around talking about how everybody needs a gun. Everybody needs an AR-15 to protect themselves against the government. Well, no, government's not coming. Only people are coming are people that go and shoot up schools, That's, that shoot up churches in Texas, that shoot up country music festivals in Las Vegas uh, that continue to shoot up neighborhoods and restaurants. Republicans on the wrong side of issue after issue after issue with middle Americans. And because they've won on them, Americans are going to have to endure the wrath of these policies, the, the lack of gun policies and the overturning of Roe in real time. And, and well, then it will ultimately turn back against them. A new new ad from the group Republican Voters Against Trump is focusing on how the former president's legal issues may be a liability for the presidency. Let's take a listen. I was, I was wondering if you guys are hiring right now. Uh, I was thinking about applying for a job. Yeah, I was um, thinking about uh, applying for a job here. I'm currently facing 88 felonies. I'm currently facing 88 felonies for detention of classified information. Do you all take people that have been found liable for sexual assault, trying to overturn the 2020 election, falsifying business records? Uh, I was wondering if that was going to be a, be a problem. Donald Trump has been charged with 88 felonies and found liable for sexual assault. If Trump is too big of a liability to get a job at your local mall, he is too big of a liability to be president of the United States. 
Wow. Let's bring in the executive director of the Republican Accountability Project, Sarah Longwell. Sarah, great to have you on the show this morning. Um, I, I do think that it's unknown how things might change for Trump as these trials drag on, especially the one he's in now. Um, and that ad kind of crystallizes some of the challenges he faces straight ahead. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the liability for President Trump with the cases that are still in the future? Well, look, um, as you know, I do focus groups with swing voters and voters across the political spectrum every week. And one of the things that we could see is that because Donald Trump has so many charges against him, there are so many different cases, uh, the voters are having difficulty kind of you know, teasing them out, understanding the difference. Mm -hmm. And because this one right now, basically because it contains the word porn star in the description, sometimes voters uh, take it less seriously than they do some of the ones that we aren't sure whether or not will actually come to trial uh, before the election. And so what we wanted to do with the ad is really underscore that Donald Trump's level of legal liability, this guy couldn't get a job at the local mall. <laughs> Right. The idea that he, you know, a fast food restaurant wouldn't hire him with his record. And so the idea that we would make him president of the United States again, like we get numb to it. Right. We get sort of numb to who Donald Trump is. And because it's always so much, it's so many charges, it's so many, uh, you know, felonies. It's easy to just let it wash over you. But we really wanted to underscore this is crazy. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. you know, the idea that we would give this man access to classified documents again after the way that he handled classified documents, refused to give them back. I mean, there's just so many things about what we have seen from his behavior since he has been president. I'm not talking about even the person we saw uh, who was president, but what we know about him since uh, he left office uh, that right. absolutely is disqualifying. And I think that because there's a numbness to voters because you've got sort of two functional incumbents running against each other. People are sort of depressed by uh, just sort of seeing a rerun of 2020. You do have to start showing people just how crazy this is. We're gonna have to have new ways sort of wake people up to right. the insanity of all this. Sarah, it's Donnie. <clears throat> I think that ad is fantastic, and I think the work you've been doing has been fantastic. You're doing, as you mentioned, a lot of focus groups with Republican voters. What seems to be the key button issue or issues that is resonating with Republican voters who are possibly going to be leaving Trump and going to Biden? So when there's sort of these um, two-time Trump voters who have decided that they're out on Donald Trump, it tends to be January 6th. Like, there was a break moment for a certain section of Republican voters. I know we hear a lot about um, how, and it's true, look, most Republican voters absolutely uh, are, are tolerant of Trump's behavior, defend his behavior, um, have continued to go from, you know, January 6th being a terrible day to now, you know, supporting, uh, saying that, you know, the, the January 6th, the people who attacked the Capitol uh, are hostages. But there are this subset of people, and I got to tell you, they tend to be older Republicans, uh, because there are the Republicans who came of age under Ronald Reagan, uh, who, you know, still believe in a Republican Party based on limited government, free markets, American leadership in the world. And they're the ones who, after January 6th, said, I'm done. Now, not all of those people are going to vote for Joe Biden. A lot of them are still very tribal, um, but they will not vote for Donald Trump again. And then obviously there's also abortion uh, is a big issue for a lot of Republican men and women. Um, and then these court cases, you know, there is still a group of voters who think that, look, uh, if, if the president is if former president is convicted uh, of a crime, that that makes it much harder for them to vote for him. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah Longwell, thank you so much. Charlie Sykes, I'm curious your thoughts. And like one of the uh, uh, one of the most important swing states, if not the most important swing state of Wisconsin, um, how do you think the trials are going to play for undecided voters? Well, of course, we don't actually know, but um, I, you know, I continue to be somewhat skeptical that, that there's any voter that will watch these trials and say, hey, I didn't vote for Donald Trump before, but now I'm going to vote for the guy. Um, because, yeah. uh, you know, as Sarah says, we have been numbed about it, but uh, over mm -hmm. the next few months, we're going to be reminded who this guy is. And I think what what this ad does is it highlights something that I think is really extraordinary, kind of you know, run through the mental experiment of imagining what job in American society 
would Donald yeah. Trump be qualified for other than the presidency? We have saved yeah. our absolute lowest standard. You wouldn't hire him at the mall. You wouldn't hire him to babysit right. your kids. You would not hire him to be um, the CEO of a publicly traded company. You cannot imagine Never. any institution of, edu you know, any, any school or institution of higher education hiring him. I can't imagine no. any corporation putting him on their board of directors. Never. He wouldn't be qualified for any position in the U.S military to just you know, go through all of this. So it's an interesting point. If you wouldn't do business with him, if you wouldn't hire him, if you wouldn't associate him, why would you give him the nuclear codes? Why would you make him the yeah. commander in chief and put him back in the presidency? I think that's a very powerful, uh, that's a very, very powerful argument. And I think it will play with at least a subset yeah. of undecided swing voters. Well, it certainly should. A critical question to be answered by those undecided voters over the next six months. Thanks so much, Charlie. Thank you to the Thank Washington you. Post, Jackie Elevate, Thank for you, Jackie. your great reporting as always. All right, Greatly good to have you all it. this morning. Columbia University is holding classes virtually today following demonstrations over the war in Gaza on campus. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin brings us the latest. This morning, as demonstrations continue on university campuses, New York's Columbia University announcing all classes will be held virtually today. University President Manu Shafiq issuing a statement saying, we need a reset to de-escalate the rancor. The university also announcing Sunday that it is adding more security on campus, including 111 additional safety personnel. The move comes as a rabbi at Columbia is urging students to return home as soon as possible. Rabbi Eli Buechler in a letter to Jewish students this weekend going on to say no one should have to endure this level of hatred, let alone at school. The campus tends amid demonstrations denouncing the Israel-Hamas war. New York Mayor Eric Adams condemning videos such as this, which he says shows a young woman with a sign pointing to Jewish students stating al Qassam's next targets. Adams also pointing to one incident last week, a demonstrator chanting, we are Hamas. Shafiq saying in her statement, tensions have been exploited and amplified by individuals who are not affiliated with Columbia, who have come to campus to pursue their own agendas. Jewish students expressing fear. As a Jew, I no longer feel welcome on campus. I no longer feel safe on campus. I no longer feel like I belong. To be honest, no. I think my safety has definitely been compromised in a lot of ways over the past few days. Last night, in a press release, Columbia Students for Justice in Palestine expressed frustration over, quote, inflammatory individuals who do not represent us, adding that the group rejects any form of hate or bigotry. And the White House saying calls for violence and physical intimidation targeting Jewish students have absolutely no place on any college campus or anywhere in the United States of America. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent and anchor Yasmin Vesugi, and who is live outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan, also with us. Former U.S. attorney and MSNBC contributor Chuck Rosenberg and state attorney for Palm Beach County, Dave Ehrenberg, editor of the nonpartisan Group Protect Democracy, Amanda Carpenter is back along with us, as well as Elise Jordan, Rev Al. But Yasmin, let's start with you. And the new concerns from one of the seated jurors. Tell us what's happening inside the courtroom. This is, Mika, exactly what we had predicted would happen, so, but so far so good. So juror number nine came in, had some concerns about uh, media attention uh, with the trial. It's something that we had predicted could feasibly happen after two days of thinking about really the gravity of this case, the nature of the case, the attention surrounding the case as well. Uh, they went into the judge's chambers, both attorneys from both sides, both prosecution and defense went into the judge's chambers as well to have a private conversation uh, with juror number nine as the former president of the United States sat at the defense table all by himself because he said he didn't want to be involved in any of the sidebar conversations. Um, and as they emerge from the judge's chambers, it seems as if now uh, juror number nine is remaining intact and remaining inside um, this jury pool still. So still having those uh, 12 members of the jury, five women, um, seven men with six alternates. Let's talk opening statements, guys, for a moment. Um, and one thing else I want to add before we move on to opening statements, it seems as if uh, the trial will go into recess at 1230 this afternoon afternoon because a juror has a dental emergency that they need to attend to. So instead of a 2 p.m. recess because of Passover, it's now going to be 1230 recess. 
Opening statements, 40 minutes from the prosecution, 25 minutes from the defense. This is shorter than we had expected. We thought it was going to be about 60 minutes to each. Let me just give you some context I'm getting from inside the courtroom, and that is because there's going to be a lot of dates. There's going to be a lot of details, um, a lot of storytelling in both of these opening statements, hence the reason why they don't want to overwhelm many of these jurors that are going to be sitting through these opening statements. What we expect from the prosecution, we don't know who's going to be delivering the opening statements from the prosecution side as of yet. It's going to be a story. It's going to be in the lead up to the November elections, the desperation of the former president in those final moments as the Access Hollywood tape came out. There was some back and forth as to whether or not the Access Hollywood tape can be admitted as evidence. They will not be able to play the Access Hollywood tape, but they can admit the transcript of the Access Hollywood tape as evidence. They will tell the story of how David Pecker approached Michael Cohen and said Stormy Dan is going to come forward with her story about having had sex with Donald Trump back in 2006 and how she was going to be go, go public with that story. They're going to talk about the payment of $130,000 made to Stormy Daniels, the payment of $150,000 made to Karen McDougal, who says she allegedly had an affair with Donald Trump back in 2006 um, as well. And then they will move to the defense for opening statements, who will talk about witness credibility, how Michael Cohen, how Stormy Daniels have an ax to grind. Um, they'll talk uh, specifically about the payments made by Donald Trump to Michael Cohen and said these were legal fees. This was an attorney who worked for Donald Trump for a very long time and that Donald Trump didn't know about uh, what Michael Cohen was doing with both Stormy Daniels and with Karen McDougal in arranging these payments. And then on to that first witness that we are learning is David Pecker, who sat above AMI for almost two decades. And as I mentioned, helped arrange those payments to Karen McDougal. Uh, they'll talk about the Trump Tower meeting back in 2015. And they'll talk about the White House meeting in 2017 when David Pecker visits, visited Donald Trump as he was the president of the United States. It is going to be a jam-packed day, but a short day, guys, as court will go into recess again at 1230 <clears throat> this afternoon. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.